Better at Home, a project of the Atlanta Scholars Colel. Let's start with uh, a character. Let's start with giving, the, ca the character of giving. Well, most of us, most of us give, you know, especially if you have kids, you're giving all the time. Carpool, buying them things, taking care of them, calming them down. We're giving. If you're in a relationship, you're giving. Hopefully, or else the relationship won't be around for long. But all of us have, to some degree, a resistance to giving. It's mine. There's even a concept in psychology called loss aversion. Loss aversion is the idea that you have a harder time giving away something that you already identify with than losing something, even a larger amount, that's not yet yours. Right? Uh, you have a choice to lose 20 bucks of your own that you already have in exchange for losing a thousand you don't even own, and people have a hard time di discussing that. Loss aversion. It's mine. It's mine. It's mine. I, I, don't want to, I don't want it to leave being mine. It's a difficult thing. You know, um, part of this, part of the challenge of giving is, you know, we have a law in the Torah. V'yahavta l'reacha kamocha. You shall love your fellow Jew as much as yourself. As much as myself? Huh? Now, of course, if you're the kind of person who says, I don't like myself so much. I've heard that too. That's not what this means. <laughs> That's not what this means. In fact, Rabbi Akiva explains it in the Talmud. Whatever you don't like done to you, don't do to others. You see, it makes it simpler, right? But we identify a lot with ourselves. And it makes it harder to give something to someone else, to overcome that. So, look, in the end, hopefully most of us give charity, we give of our time. But if this is something we need to work on, then there's ways to work on it. We've got to do something. So you'll notice in the Better at Home practicum for this, one of the ideas is take some things in your home that you know someone else will appreciate more than you and give it to them. Now, not garbage. Don't go around the house spring cleaning and then give away the garbage. Something that, you know, you wouldn't have thrown away yet. You wouldn't have given away. And you say, but then I want it. Okay, so buy another one and give it to your friend. Or give it away and then if you need another one, you'll buy another one. You know, truth is after a while you realize, ah, I don't miss it so much. You're not doing this because, let's say, that person is upset or sad and you're trying to help them feel better. You're doing this so that you can develop a feeling of giving and get used to giving and maybe even start enjoying it, right? Another example I have in the practicum is doing something around the house that's not your job. You know, we all, we all have that. This is not my job. You know, the years go by and we sort of settle into what's my job and what's your job. Right? And we sort of settle into that. that. That's fine. Usually that happens because my tendencies, your tendencies, you're up later at night, I, I wake up earlier in the morning, you don't mind the smell of garbage, you find cleaning the dishes gross, whatever, you know. But take a job that's not yours and do it. Now you notice how this giving here isn't something tangible. You're just doing a favor. But I didn't have to. You're right, I didn't have to. Right? Now, obviously, we're not trying to turn you into someone who is, uh, you know, a doormat. I have to do everything for everyone. Yeah, I, listen, in some houses, if you're the one already doing everything for everyone, find another way to give. You know? But the reality is, most of us need to develop that. And by the way, so now that we're talking about doing things that are not tangible, you know, one of them is giving charity. Give it, give it charity. But you can give a lot of things. You can give advice. You can give a smile. You can give so much. You know, um, when I was a young fella, I was in high school. And it was a challenging time for me. I don't have uh, 45 hours to tell you all of the fun stories. And also, I would owe you lots of money for all the therapy that I'd be getting telling you those stories. But I'm going to share one story, which is that in this high school, there was a great sage, a very, a very wise man, who was already very elderly, 
who was sort of kept on staff as a, uh, they called him Mashkiach. Mashkiach would be like a Musser advisor. He pretty much mostly only spoke Yiddish. And his name was Rabbi Mordechai Schwab. And um, I really didn't have much to do with him because, you know, he mainly spoke Yiddish. Once a week he'd give a lecture in Yiddish that I kind of understood. It was about, you know, personal growth. His grandson was in my class. And one day at recess, his grandson comes over to me and says, my grandfather wants to talk to you. Now, I had never been called into his office or to a personal consultation with him. It just didn't happen. Um, I mean, I'd been called into the principal's office plenty of times, but not this, this rabbi. And uh, sheesh, I mean, what, what have I done now if I got called up to him? So I walked up to the Beit Midrash, and he was sitting in the front all alone. There was nobody there. And he pulls me over, and he opens up a chumash, and he says, I mean, you know, we, we, we dealt with it with the broken Yiddish and English. And he shows me a verse where it describes the Jews going into Israel. Levein shinayim mechalav. They'll have healthy, bright, white teeth from all the milk in the, in the land. You know, it's a land flowing with milk and honey. So the teeth will be healthy and white. And he says, you need to smile. I'd like to see you smile. I thought I was in trouble. And this was a man who noticed that I was sad. And he decided he needed to just sort of like cheer me up, give a smile. Now, he didn't know it was wrong because he kind of wasn't involved in the day to day. He was more of like a figurehead. But that was giving too. And especially because this man, Rabbi Mordechai Schwab, this was his superpower, smiling. And what I mean by that is that if you would greet him, he would smile like this. And he'd take your hands with two hands and smile like this. How are you? I was, uh, um, the next year, there was a program called the uh, Siyam Ashas. The Siyam Ashas is a uh, program where people around the world, they study Talmud. And um, at the end of the seven and a half year cycle, many Jews celebrate the completion of the Talmud. Even people who haven't done it, they just show up to the party. And as the party got bigger, nowadays they hold them in stadiums. And even back then, it was in Madison Square Garden. So uh, a bunch of us from high school were going with the high school to this program. And of course, down on the, down on the main court, it's not basketball players, but great rabbis. So I'm up in the bleachers, in the nosebleeds. So the folks down on the court look like little ants. And there's a, a table full of great rabbis. And I see... At the end of a table, a man walks up to a rabbi with a big white beard. And the rabbi with the white beard grips the hand of the man coming to him and does this. I was like, oh, there's Rabbi Schwab. <laughs> I could tell all the way from the nosebleeds. There's a man who greets everyone with a smile, a big smile, and a big double-handed, how are you? That's giving too. I mean, he wasn't a rich man, but he found a way. He found a way to give. There's another thing that comes up with giving, is that sometimes you want to give, but the person doesn't want to take. And that's understandable, because the truth is we don't, you know, if we're working on giving, we don't want to work, we want to work on not being a taker. There's a, a story about Rabbi Ari Levine in Israel, who, um, he saw that one of the kids in his school was poor and his shoes were falling apart. But every time he tried to, you know, figure out a way to give the family a little money, the father would get upset, you know, people are uncomfortable that way. So, he came up with an idea. He told the kid, next week, we're having a big quiz with prizes. So, your, time, your schedule for uh, 3 o'clock on Tuesday. He wasn't really giving a quiz to anyone else. Takes the kid in his office, gives him a quiz, you know, of about what they're studying, but not very difficult. And he says, you win! And he says, I have a new pair of shoes, and uh, if you like, I'll make that your prize, because I see your shoes are pretty worn out. So the kid takes the shoes, and now the, he comes and tells the dad, hey, I want a new pair of shoes, and we're by doing good on a quiz. It's not charity, right? Very creative. Right? He just wanted to give the guy, take care of him, help him. Sometimes you have to think creatively how to help someone, how to give someone. Right? There's non-tangible giving, there is financial giving, 
And we have to think of ways to give. And again, just like the principles of better at home or of Musser are when it's time to give, if there's a resistance in the mind, what is the resistance? What is it saying? What if, what if I don't have enough for myself? What if this person thinks I'm a, you know, a, a doormat? What if, fight those feelings, learn what it means. And if this is not the character trait that you need to work on for a lifetime, that's fine. But this is practice, learning how to do this. And when you get the sheet, the handout, with some examples of practical things, it's important that you pick one. Either you pick one of the ones that's suggested on the sheet of something that you're going to work on in a practical way for this week or two, or come up with your own. But the key is to take one of those, go through it, follow the cognitive process of the resistance, and see what's right or wrong about it. Make yourself do it and see how it feels. Because we're going to do that for the rest of these character traits. And then when this program is done, you can figure what are the character traits you want to work on and apply the same methodology. So go ahead and take that sheet. Now in addition, the sheet that we're hanging, handing out, which has the methodology of this, ideas of practical things you can take upon yourself to work on it, but also a family discussion sheet. You can discuss with a friend, you can discuss with your spouse, you can discuss with everyone at the table, which are stories and lessons with questions to discuss about understanding this character trait. And I think that's just as important as part of this. It's sort of, this is what's going to be on your mind for a week or two. This character and how to transform it and think about it within your own space. And hopefully with enough work, we're going to change.